Let's spend money in alignment with the goals you want to create. Let's measure the pleasure you're getting from where you're spending your money. And when we make it conscious and when we focus on those expenses first, then we can bring everything in alignment. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited today to have Rennie Gaber with us, and he's going to talk to us about the two solid fundamentals that lead to wealth. Rennie is the author of the best-selling book, Wealth on Any Income, that's been translated into eight languages. He failed high school math, was broke at 50, but after applying these two fundamental wealth principles, became a multimillionaire in a few years while only earning 5000 a month. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rennie. Uh, thank you, Wade. Thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate the opportunity. My pleasure. And I've gotten a chance over the last a few weeks to get to know Rennie a little bit better. I'm really impressed by what a student he is, how willing he is to learn, uh, despite already having a lot of success. Maybe if we wouldn't mind starting here, Rennie, would you share a little bit about your story? What got you on this journey? And <laughs> a little bit, yeah, you are laugh because you're familiar with it. Share yeah. a little bit, a guy there, because I know in listening to it, what I love about it is it, it's, it's so accessible and, and it's so makes people feel like it's possible for them to do it too. Yeah, well, it, 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 I laugh about it because, uh, like you mentioned, I failed high school math. Uh, so <laughs> it, it wasn't, um, it, the attitude was in one of the important things from the standpoint that I had to recognize that uh, failure or success in high school has nothing to do with what happens in real life. And uh, I did everything I could to stay away from any math class in college. I had uh, taken one class and did really well in it, which surprised me. And it was so simple. I was actually tutoring other students. Uh, but there was one class I took and I figured, okay, math is not my thing. I'm going to stay away from it. And so I graduate college. And after a year of teaching school, I entered the financial services business. It's all about math. So makes no sense, but that's what I did. Um, and I guess the point is, I mean, I, I love your concept of the three-day weekend because in reality, I really never wanted to work. And so I was always looking at what can I do to create a passive income or what can I do uh, to create residual income, whatever it is. And the fundamentals were never there. And what I mean by that is I never learned how to do a personal budget. And here's the embarrassing part. I'm certified as a financial planner and it was not in my coursework. So I'm taking all these classes to learn how to handle money. I'm a chartered life underwriter and none of this is teaching me how to handle money on a foundational basic level. And then I interview CPAs and I find out it's not in their coursework either. So it, any of the people that the public would turn to to learn how to handle their money effectively on a foundational level has not been taught that information. It, so I, I find myself after a couple divorces, I'd also had a business failure. I'm age 50. I'm broke. Uh, there was a time earlier when one of the episodes after my first divorce, I had so little money, I had to collect soda pop bottles and cans to get the refund money to buy food for my children. So I know what it's like to have absolutely no money. And by age 50, I figured this is not, <laughs> this is not working. I got to figure out what wealthy people are doing. My job as a certified financial planner was I supported them in protecting their wealth and reducing taxes. But there's, like I said, there's no instruction about how to create it. So I looked at what do they do and what I saw, and you know, this is my limited vision. I saw that most of them who had businesses were funneling their money into projects outside like real estate, apartment buildings, multiple houses, the land on which their manufacturing plant uh, was located, uh, the office park in which they had an office. Um, I said, okay, I need to buy real estate, but I've got no money. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I used one of the concepts, one of the foundational concepts, which is called pay yourself first. Now, Wade, you're probably going to be able to answer this question. But have you, heard, it's a two-part question. First is, have you heard of the concept pay yourself first? 
Absolutely. It's, it's talked about. I've learned it from so many people. Okay, great. Now, can you explain it? The symbols, way I understand it, is before you give money to any other entity, any other, your bills, your, your rent, anything that you make sure that some of your money goes into investments. 10% is usually a common number. More lately, I hear people saying 20%. Okay, perfect. So you are able to answer it. That puts you, now th this is going to maybe be a shock, that puts you in 10% of the population that can even explain it, let alone do it. And so, because I mean, I have, you know, I, I, get interviewed on a lot of podcasts and I'll often ask that of the host and nine out of 10 times they can't explain it. So they're just a reflection of the general public. And what I'm getting at is I had tried it twice before age 50, but at age 50, I realized I've got to be serious about this. So I'm making 5,000 a month, which is why the book is called wealth on any income. I'm setting aside $500 a month, the 10%. And in three years, I saved up a whopping $18,000. But my, my third and final and best wife, we've been married 22 years now, um, had a realtor who said, came to us and said, oh, you should buy this triplex. And I'm in Los Angeles and $18,000 isn't going to buy anything. So my wife chipped in 18,000 and the realtor said, this is such a good deal. I'm chipping in 36. So it took the three of us to buy the property. So crucial element number one is pay yourself first. Crucial element number two is wealth creation is a team sport, not a solo sport. It took the three of us to buy the property. And after my having two other divorces and a business failure, my credit wasn't any good. So I actually had to use their credit to, you know, they added me to the loans, but it wasn't because I had decent credit. So we went from that first three unit purchase within eight years, we had 50, five, zero units we owned and managed. And this is a, uh, how do I phrase it? Uh, an attitude that the wealthy have, you can use debt to create wealth. So I borrowed money to make down payments with more on more apartment buildings with my wife and this realtor. And that's how we got to 50 units in, in eight years from the time I was 50. Well, actually it would be five years because it was three years just to save up the first little bit of money I had. So that's the story and I'm that's sticking awesome. to it. So <laughs> Awesome. So you and I talked a lot on the pre-interview and because I also have a, the Charter Life Underwriter, I'm come from a field and, and so interested in how many people, again, even from a field that have letters after their name, don't mm -hmm. practice what they preach. I've made some of my own foolish mistakes. And I wonder if we can break this down and, and, and ask for your wisdom on a couple things. So first one, the concept of borrowing money to make money can work out well. And of course, if it's not executed well, uh, it can be something that's not so good. So for example, as an entrepreneur, uh, there's a common belief, it's not often spoken about, but it seems to happen that as entrepreneurs, some of us believe that there are these entrepreneurial gods that if we invest enough money in something, if we drop $10,000 on a credit card of a course that some dude or some dude that is giving, <laughs> that the entrepreneurial gods are going to smile upon us and we're going to be wealthy. And genuinely, without making fun of it, because I've done that at times, and not in yeah. a pure sense of magic, I'm willing to do the work, but this sense of when it makes sense, so I would now, if someone were to tell me, Wade, should I, for example, as an entrepreneur, bootstrap or invest a lot? I would say bootstrap as long as you can. To me, that's a fundamental. What are some of the things that people often miss? Because when you hear about real estate, and I, I know you know this, it's kind of like the, the the life insurance field. There's a whole range of success and failure. There's a whole range of cast of characters that are in that field. What are some of the distinctions that you would say to somebody that said, but no, I've done this? Because in my case, a few of us, we did do a triplex and we lost, but we missed, we didn't do the research. We didn't do the fundamentals. We were motivated by fear. So there's a couple of things that set us up poorly, whereas even though there were certain things we did do right, uh, that we did do not right. Uh, so what would you say are some of the things that the people who are listening have said, oh, I, you know, I've heard this before, or I'm scared to do this. What are some of the more the nitty gritty details where people often stumble? I, I would say it, it's, it's more, not necessarily nitty gritty details, 
but it gets back a little bit to the research you're talking about. And that's where you want to look for a track record. And the realtor that uh, my wife and I invested with had a track record. He already had, uh, I think it was like three or maybe it was four rental houses. He knew how to find good deals. He knew what to do with them to increase the rents. And all I was bringing to the table was uh, some education that I had from 14 years earlier, where I took a class at UCLA on how to manage and profit with apartment buildings. And I said, well, instead of buying single family houses, you know, if you're going to buy something, why not buy an apartment building? And, you know, like you said, you bought a triplex. Well, uh, he knew what good areas were. He knew what could be done to improve the property. Uh, I had the, the skills to manage people better than he did. But the point is, it was the combination of talents that we each had. And if you look at a successful business, I, I'm not sure if this is off, off track or not, but I think it, it's on track. I also did some angel investing and I ended up learning a lot about what it takes to have a successful business. So if you're talking about where do you put your money, um, there's a book, I, I can't put my hands on it at the moment, but it was taught by a, a professor at MIT on like 22 attributes of a startup that if you do them in the right order, you've got a 50-50 chance of success where most startups are in the 8% chance of success. Um, but what I discovered is that there are two divergent personalities required to have a successful business. And one of them is a vision master. And you see that with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. You see that with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Uh, you see that with Elon Musk and the people who are running his divisions. Um, you know, I could go on and on. But the point is, you have a vision master and you have an execution master. If you have two vision masters, it ain't going to work. You have two execution masters, it's not going to work. You need one person with the vision and someone else who has the technical skills or the attitude to carry out that vision. That's what works really well. And, you know, hey, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger <laughs> have done really well with that pairing. So that's awesome. And I think uh, one of the things, oh, sorry, go ahead. So anyway, in answer to your question, in terms of the fundamentals, it's who are the personalities involved and do they have a track record? Awesome. I think that's something that, well, in our case, we didn't have that person. We were all trying to be that person. Um, we were all the visionaries and we had a contact that knew that, you know, knew some information. Again, we, to our understanding, we had done research, but- yeah. We did not have somebody that said, look, here's what I've done. I've done this two, three, four, five times. And the ironic thing is not the ironic, the, the sad thing, we would have been totally open to that. We just didn't even know that that person was a person on the team, if you will. We <laughs> thought, okay, we, we, we thought we had all the teammates. We thought we were good. And that's something I think is, is unfortunate, especially when people, you know, in our case, we put a lot of hard earned money into that and, and it didn't work out. When you talk with people about, the fundamentals, the paying yourself first. I know a lot of people have a lot of reasons why they don't do that. What do you tell the person, maybe even from your personal experience of what was that shift that helped you decide, okay, hey, I've, you know, because I've heard about it and as you and I both know, yeah. there are people who've heard about saving 10% and don't necessarily do it. How do you help somebody or make that shift or even maybe first, what was it that helped you make that shift? Well, there are two things. Um, one of them is at age 50, I'm looking down the road 15 years and saying, well, am I going to be eating cat food or tuna? <laughs> so I've got to take it seriously. I've, I figured I got 15 years left. That's number one. Number two is, um, it's an excuse from the standpoint of when someone says they can't do it, they've got to pay the grocery bills or they can't do it. If they cover the rent, they won't have enough money left over. Um, and I had this conversation years and years ago with an attorney. And he said, well, I had uh, $5,500 of uh, money come in, my receivables, but I've got $6,000 of bills. There's no way I can pay myself first. I'm short $500 as it is. So I said, let me ask you this. So let's say you set aside just 250 bucks. That's all. Set aside 250 bucks. 
Now you're 750 short. What difference does it make? But now you at least have $250. It's yours for all the work you did. Now this is money you own, like you deserve to own some of the money you're earning. And he, he was at least open enough to do it. And as a result, the money that started flowing in from his billings exceeded his bills. He now had the emotional attitude that, hey, I'm going to get to keep some of this money instead of just being a conduit for it. And he was able to bring in more money. So I don't know if that was the universe saying, oh, now we see you know how to handle money better. We'll give you more of it. Or if it was his own attitude that said, I know now, I know I'll get to keep some of it. So I'm going to make sure I get more of it instead of the cycle just continuing. Yeah, I think there's so much to that of the expectations we set. There's, of course, as you and I both know, so much research around what we aim for is something that is more likely to happen. The more we focus on, the more we look look yep. to it. And, you know, as I just tell people with business, and it's, it's, it's a detail. When I work with small business owners, just the detail, though it's, it's, it's huge in implementation, of looking at your numbers once a year versus once a month you have so much more time to course correct. It's like if you're in a a class and a teacher, you you get a quiz every week and you keep getting C's, you're not going to be surprised when you get a C at the end of the course, as opposed (laughs) to the the class where the whole class, you think you're doing great and you take the final and you get a D like, well, well, what just happened? I didn't know that. I think so much of that is sort of the subtle disciplines of making sure uh, that we're on top of things. And, you know, some people listen to this and say, well, wait, uh, you know, is, is there magic going on here? And, and again, I think, I don't know how you'd say it. First of all, I don't, ex- I don't pretend to understand everything about how the universe works. God, this, that, the other. Yeah. I happen to believe there's a God. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But I do know that even something as simple as, well, okay, in that first month, like you said, maybe I'm short 750. But already in my mind, I'm thinking next month, hey, wait, I've got to make room for that 250. So it allows for that course correct. Can you share a little bit about how that even helps, even if people don't believe in woo-woo or magic, how it starts shaping your brain when you do start paying yourself first and then perhaps adjusting some of your expenses in just sort of a very fundamentally sound, grounded, you know, physical plane way. Yeah. Well, I'll answer that after I explain something that's really important. And I I finished another book and it's called the attitudes of the wealthy. It's got like 32 different attitudes. One of the most important is the difference between what wealthy people do and what ordinary people do when it comes to thinking and hearing familiar information. As an example, we could be talking about a budget or like I asked you if you knew what the expression was, pay yourself first. Yes, I know what that is. And what an ordinary person does when they hear familiar information is they make a statement like, I know that, or I've heard that before. That's not new to me, whatever. But the wealthy mindset asks questions. And that's really key when we're talking about, you know, What do I do this month to make it better? If someone is making a statement like, I'm going to be short money. Uh, This won't work out for me. Uh, The clients I have are no good. Those statements don't lead to any transformation. What would lead to a transformation is a question like, where do I find better clients? What do I need to do to bring in more money? When will I begin doing something? Who can support me with this? Those questions lead to the answers that produce the results the person's looking for. And statements don't take a person anywhere. So I wanted to bring that up. So I was touching on it in terms of, well, what are the questions you ask? And that provides the solutions to the problem of there not being enough money, or you're going to be short this month, or what do I need to do to have the extra 250? It comes from the questions you ask, not statements you make. I think that's so true. There's so many people that have said that. I know Tony Robbins has a quote, you know, the quality of your questions yep. determines the quality of your life, or something I'm paraphrasing. I know Dan Sullivan, one of the uh, most <laughs> successful coaches for entrepreneurs, has a book, The Power of Questions. I mean, yeah. so much of this. and. I just think that it, a question opens up possibility. I sometimes tell my children that. Sometimes um, one of my children is very intent of what they know. And they'll say, well, dad, this isn't working and you can't fix it. I said, okay, hold on. There's two statements there. There's this isn't working. Okay, I'll accept that. 
how about you start with, hey, dad, can you fix this? Because you know, sometimes I can. I know you might not, you know, it's, it's your kid. Yeah. So, of course, you, yeah. you know, they, 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 they can bring out a lot of the mortality in you and, and see your flaws <laughs> very easily. But I said, some of these things I can actually perhaps, or at least let, let's even start with that question. And I think a lot of people give up on the questions. They get into the question and the, because the question does require some thought process. It requires some work. It might require getting uncomfortable. What came up for you or what comes up for people when the questions start leading to, okay, now I've got to change. Now I've got to shift. What do you find are some of the obstacles people have when we talk about comfort being who they've been, uh, identifying a certain way? And, and what can people do that's simple to start saying, okay, well, I might have this, I might have had this track record of all these losses or things that didn't work out the way I worked, you know, wanted them to. How do we start making a shift? How do we start believing enough to make a shift and build some momentum in the direction we want to go? Well, one of them is actually breaking down what it is that went wrong in the past. And it could be the belief systems. And it could be that, well, in, in my case, one of the things that I noticed is the business failures I had in the past were the thing, businesses where I was in total control and I didn't have any partners. And so when I, when I started looking back on my life, one of the things that I noticed is, well, the successful businesses were the ones I wasn't alone in. As an example, I had a pension administration company and I had two other partners. We sold that off to a public company. That was very profitable. Um, I had a book publishing company where I was the only one. Yes, I had people who did editing and printing and this and that, but there was no partner in the business that I could bounce ideas off of or who had more experience than I did. And I, to say that business was mediocre would be a compliment. <laughs> so, I mean, we had 80 titles in the bookstores, but at the same time, when I compared it to what I was doing in real estate, I was making $1.50 an hour in the book publishing and $700 an hour in real estate. So, I, you know, so... I think that gives you an idea of the difference between doing it by myself and looking at that. And when you talked about the Tony Robbins quote of, you know, the quality of the questions, one of the worst questions to ask is a why question. Like, why doesn't this work for me? Why don't I have good clients? Well, any answer will do. Like, well, the reason you don't have good clients is because you're a jerk. Okay, fine. That doesn't solve anything. It's, it, it's the proper question. Start with what, when, where, how, or who. They don't start with why. So if someone just uses those words to start the sentence, they'll get better results. That is so unbelievably true. I was working on my master's degree in psychology and I experienced the privilege of going into uh, 12 step meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. And cause I was taking kids there for them to go to the meetings and that exact same thing. I remember people saying, and I heard it so many different times, why is going to get you right back in, you know, mm. getting to relapse because why is all the drama, the sob story, the why me? Why this? Why that? Which is very different than what Simon Sinek talks about, which is mm -hmm. what is your why? Yeah. Like what's, yeah. you know, what motivates your you? Your purpose. So to be that's really clear, yeah. that's, a, that's a different concept. But why me? Why this? Why that? And other than, as you said, the mechanics. So I, for example, I can look back and say at our triplex and say, okay, we were missing a strategic partner. And, and there's a, a nuance. So to a certain degree, you could say why or what didn't we do or how. But definitely so much of this is about first, at least assuming it's possible. And to me, when you get caught up in the why question, you might almost never get out. You might never just be stuck in that, you know, all these reasons. Is the world a, a safe place at this place at that place? There's so many things I can't prove. And in my psychology degree, I learned, well, certain things are what was the big fancy word, efficacy. They work for me. So yeah, exactly. Big fancy word. <laughs> yeah. So it works It works for me to believe there's a God. I can't prove there's a God. It's efficacy for me. Great. So I move on with that. If someone wants to argue that with me, I mean, I'll, I'll entertain a, a great philosophical debate about God, but at, at the end of the day, it works for me. So that's fine. Um, one of the things that people get into the conversation of is debt and what they should do with debt or 
Uh, there's so many different ways to approach debt. And you and I both know if humans were rational, well, the answer is easy. You pay off the highest debt first. You go to the lowest, you know, you, you, make, you go to the highest asset first. If we were, and that, that, that's the huge asterisk, if we were rational, <laughs> then you do things in a certain order. So Dave Ramsey, for example, talks about snowballing and you pay off yep. debt in a certain way and different things. What have you found that is maybe unconventional about how people should handle debt? You mentioned even the idea of, you know, perhaps going into debt 250 to start something. So what are some of the unconventional ideas that help people? And then at the same time, the same question, but what is where people get themselves in trouble? So some people say, oh, I'm going to do what Rennie says. I'm just going to keep doing this, but I'm going to keep spending poorly. It's like, whoa, whoa, no, no, Rennie didn't say that. <laughs> Rennie didn't say keep building up credit card debt and then try to make, you know, what do you see that maybe people don't know? And, and what are some of those uh, red flags for people? Uh, th there's a bunch of them. And first, you know, you mentioned Dave Ramsey. And the funniest part about it is this is something I wrote about and I was talking about, oh, about tw 25 years ago. <clears throat> and then someone said, oh, that's the snowball uh, way of paying off debt. You look at the lowest balance first. I don't care about the interest rate. And you focus on that. And one of the other things has to do with a personal budget. And the, where I found out about this personal budget, you laugh, was a program called Debtors Anonymous. A 12-step program for people who can't handle money well. And that's where I learned that all of us have expenses that show up every month that we don't account for, like your car registration fees, or the fact that you're going to have to maintain your car, or that you're going to buy clothing for your kids when they go back to school, or the property taxes, or whatever. And these don't show up every month, but they have a monthly amount you could set aside so you could be prepared for them. If you spend $1,200 a year on some item, clothing, I don't care what, but you, you're not setting aside $100 a month for clothing and you think you're covering everything, you'll find out when you have to buy the clothing, you're going to be going into debt. And on one of my forms, I have little asterisks next to all these items that have to be taken into account on a monthly basis to know that you're setting aside enough money so that these surprises don't throw you into a tailspin. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something you and I both know from looking at investing charts. When somebody looks at, when you look at a proposal or a, you know, what's the investment can be worth in X number of years, it's, it's to what you're referencing. It's those last years when that compound interest makes a big impact. And yet, now let's talk about the other part of that, because then there's the person that said, well, you know, Rennie told me to go do this, but they're still amassing credit card debt, which I think, to, let's be really clear, is a very different thing. You're not saying, correct me if I'm wrong, continue to amass the credit card debt and invest. We're saying, no, no, you stop amassing more credit card debt. You get your budget in track. And so we're looking at a, put it this way, we're not looking at a credit card that you're continuing to add to while you invest. You're saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to get a handle on that because I think I've seen a lot of people that will say, oh, no, I'm just going to keep doing what I do. And I'm going to hope the investment and I'm going to count on the Ibsen charts and I'm going to count that everything's going to do 10, 11% forever. And, and that's a, a pattern that I've seen almost, again, focuses on half of the equation, leaving out the other. What are yes. your thoughts on that? Uh, that you're absolutely correct. And one of the things that I learned, again, this goes back to Debtors Anonymous, was it's not about making more money. I continually made more money year after year. And as, uh, as an example, I started as a school teacher and I was short $100 a month. I went into sales and doubled my income and now I'm short $200 a month. Every time I thought if I just earn more money, it'll work out. And after I passed 100,000 a year and now I'm short 2,000 a month, it finally occurred to me, this doesn't work. And what I learned in Debtors Anonymous is you focus on the expenses first. You deal with the expenses and then when you make more money, you'll actually have something to keep. And that is exactly what worked to me, worked for me. So when you're talking about someone continuing to amass the credit card debt, they are not focusing on their expenses and putting together. And I don't like to call it a budget. I call it a spending plan. Let's spend money in alignment with the goals you want to create. And so with that, again, a shift in attitude, let's spend money in alignment with what you want to create. Let's measure the pleasure you're getting from where you're spending your money. 
And when we make it conscious and when we focus on those expenses first, then we can bring everything in alignment. And then when you're doing your investments, it's going to work out. Like, you know, the same thing you're saying, if you're putting the money in the investments, but you haven't changed how you handle the money, it's just not going to work out work out any better than my thinking, if I just earn more money, it'll work out. It doesn't. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's one of those things where I think of diets and sometimes people, <laughs> uh, you know, there'll be all sorts of different things that people will get into. And I know it's not the only variable from what I read or say, no, I'm not even, it's not my field, but from what I understand, you know, calories in versus calories burned is not the only part of the equation. There's other variables. But when I hear somebody say that calories in versus calories out has nothing to do with it, I'm like, whoa, no, that, that's a little strong there. Tell me there's other variables. Tell me I understand. But there's still certain fundamentals. It's like if you say, well, hey, if you're dropping eight to 30% on a credit card, and again, unless you're unless you timed Bitcoin right or something, yeah. you're not, you're not gonna, you know, those are those are fundamentals. Those are things that we might not like to hear them, um, but they they play out a certain way. Would you mind sharing a little bit about the work you're doing? Uh, to raise philanthropists by teaching the fundamentals of wealth creation. I found that very interesting. Thank you. And I'm so glad you used the word fundamentals because that is crucial. Uh, you know, people are looking for the fancy things and that isn't where the answers lie. It does lie in the fundamentals. And the purpose of the work that I'm doing is to raise other philanthropists. A hundred percent of the profits from the work that I do, whether it's my books, programs, coaching, it doesn't make any difference. hundred percent of that profit goes to a charity called shelter to soldier. And what this organization does is twofold. Uh, and I, I, I say they save two lives at a time. To start with, they're rescuing dogs from environments where they would be euthanized. And they're training them as service animals for soldiers who've come back with PTSD or traumatic brain injuries who might otherwise have committed suicide. And not one service member who's gotten their service dog has committed suicide. So they have a 100% success rate. And so soldiers that would have committed suicide are saved by dogs that would have been euthanized. So again, this charity is saving two lives at a time. Uh, I just am so in love with them. As a matter of fact, I'm moving closer and closer to being a spokesman for them, to training the soldiers with this information who've gotten their service dogs. Um, because that's the most meaningful thing that I'm doing at this point in my life is donating to the charity. And I just want to get more and more involved. That's beautiful. Uh, first of all, thank you for that on behalf of all of us. I know that's something uh, that is so needed. And I think it speaks to a question a lot of people ask is, well, Wade, what, why would I want more wealth? I know I at times have done this when I've had only a solopreneur's mindset. And there's nothing wrong with being a solopreneur, but in the sense of, okay, I just need to make sure I'm looking out for me. And that's great. And my, me being me, me, my family and that sort of stuff and being a responsible citizen. So yes. And as somebody who's had different beliefs about money introduced to him over the years, it's only recently when I was actually consulting with a client and the client said to me, well, Wade, why would I want to make so much money? It was a large amount of money to them that they were talking about and I asked them, and this this is why I believe that there's other forces in play in the universe. I said, well, because it was it was something I was struggling with and still am working on. I said, well, tell me something. If a hundred million dollars fell in your lap, would you do good stuff with it or would you do nonsense with it? And this person's like, well, I would do really good stuff with it. I said, great. I, said, I want you to have a hundred million dollars or whatever that I want that in your hands because I know that's going to get somewhere, as opposed to. Um, it not. Now that's very different than saying, you know, price gouging or anything that would, that would that, you know, yeah. where you're doing your client wrong to mm -hmm. get there. But this idea of saying, well, what if there's something better? What if there's something bigger? And like you said, with this even concept of investing, what if we focus on a more, um, a bigger possibility, a bigger game, and then seeing what serves in that way. And that's one of those things, you know, when you and I talked, that I think so awesome what you're doing with your charity, because if, you know, one of the, the tough things I find is if you, most people that are really fundamentally sound with wealth don't have a lot of desires. Think, think Warren Buffett, you know, I mean, I've driven by his house before in Omaha. I don't think, yeah. I'm not sure if it's still there, but you know, very, lives very simply. So you say, okay, when you have, you know, multiple billions of dollars, you know, what do you do with it? Well, there's other stuff that you can do with it that is, that is bigger. And so 
for whatever reason, for those people that seem to have figured out how to do that, to say, yeah, no, I'm not going to stop just because, you know, my situation is full, but to be able to do something more that I think that's, that's awesome. So, uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for uh, that work. Cause that's just, that's just beautiful work. Thank you. And one of the things that uh, I do have to work with people on his attitude. And Warren Buffett has a great expression. Uh, you brought his name up. We've brought it up several times. And he said, uh, of the billionaires I have met, money just brings out the basic traits in them. If they were jerks before they had money, they were simply jerks with a billion dollars. And the corollary to that is, a good person who becomes wealthy is still a good person. A person who contributes to others and wants to help others will be able to have a greater impact. It just amplifies who they are. And so I'm glad you had that conversation with that client because that's exactly what I'm getting at. When I have people who come to me and they're coaches or they're therapists or something like that, and they have this fear of making a lot of money, it's they're afraid it's going to corrupt them. And I need to let them know, no, if you're good now, you'll still be good with a lot of money. However, if you're already corrupt, you'll just be more corrupt with money. They recognize they're not corrupt. Now they're open to doing much better. Absolutely. And I think that's so awesome because the intention is great to say, I don't want to be corrupted by these outside forces and, and we're all human. So there's, there's certainly yeah. things that, that can happen, but I think it's so great um, to be able to do that. And I think about something you and I talked about of couples. How can couples have safe conversations around money topics? Because that's one of those other things where the intention mm -hmm. to say, I don't, you know, a, another positive intention or, or, loving intention. I don't want to argue with my spouse per se, but if that means we don't get to have the conversations about money that we need to, well, of course that can fester and lead to other situations. Um, what do you suggest to people or how do you advise people around that? It's funny. The first book my publishing company came out with was called Couples and Money by a Dr. Victoria Felton Collins, who's a psychologist and a money manager with a firm in Newport Beach, California. Uh, and in, in her book, she's got questions that couples write down the answers to on their own and then come together and discuss it. Because one of the reasons there are so many arguments over money is they each come from a different household that had different money values. And until they understand where they came from, like how their mother handled money or how their father handled money, or what did they think about in their family as they were growing up, after they answer these questions and then the couple comes together and shares those answers, now there's an understanding. It's like men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Until you know the other's language, it's difficult to communicate. But when you know the other's language, now you can have safe conversations about money. Thank you. One of the other things I find is people can reach a point where they think it's too late. Uh, you know, <laughs> I didn't get it right. I, I've been doing this so wrong. And and certainly your story and somebody might say, well, well, well you know, but Renny, I'm 60 or whatever it might be. <laughs> uh, and of course, we could talk about life expectancies and, and a gazillion other things. When you're talking with somebody who's in that space, what do you find is usually the obstacle? And you, how do you usually help them look at that. So, I mean, is it fear? Is it just that they're so disappointed, so frustrated or, um, and how, do, how, well, if you were telling, talking to a person individually, you know, what do you tell that person that hopefully perhaps gets them, uh, to consider yes, taking action as opposed to simply replaying uh, what hasn't worked. Yeah. There was a great book that I picked up at a used bookstore by Richard Bach and it's called it's never too late. And I've got clients who are in their 60s and 70s and older starting to put these concepts into place. And it's working. But, but it has, gets back to something we discussed earlier. And that's the difference between making statements and asking questions. Or someone at that stage of life, they're 60, 65 years of age, and they say, it's too late for me, is a statement. And instead, if they ask the question, well, what can I do at this stage? Who can support me at this, this stage? Where would I put my money at this stage? 
then they've got different opportunities and possibilities available. So it is shifting from making a statement, it's too late to what the, the, the proper questions that we've spoken about. Awesome. And then when you talk to people, a lot of people seem to think they need to be brilliant uh, to earn wealth. <laughs> and in fact, I find some people do the exact opposite. They assume that because they're smart, in my case, you know, collected some letters after my name and two of the most fundamentally, again, fundamentally bad decisions I made, I figured my intellect was enough to overcome those that I could, I could, you know, wiggle my way out of it. That's what, well, sometimes in my case, I was younger that I did. And I hopefully won't, hopefully won't be reporting that I did another one of those. <laughs> um, what do you tell somebody that says, yeah, but I, I'm not smart enough to do this. I'm not, I'm not brilliant enough. That's for the smart people. Um, well, it really had, I mean, you know, Hey, let's get back. I failed high school math. That was not a predictor. And these things are very simple. Um, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, it's all that's required and the support of someone else who knows more. The, okay, the best example I've got is in one of my workshops many, many, many years ago, there was a gal who came to me and said, um, my brother, uh, you know, this is the term she used, so I don't want to you know, do something politically incorrect. She said, my brother is retarded. He's got a very low IQ. And my dad told him uh, that uh, he had to set aside, I don't remember if it was 20%, 50% of the money he earned. And he could only do minimum wage jobs because he did have mental challenges, but he did have the ability to work. And he did set aside money. And I think the reason she was telling me this is because she had nothing and she was smart. And her brother, who was retarded, who just did what her dad said because he didn't know any better, had over $100,000 in savings. Now, granted, someone could take advantage of him with that, but his father was there to protect him. But the point being, she was saying, my brother was retarded and he's got $100,000 and I'm really smart and I don't have anything. Wow. And yeah, it's, it's execution. Wow, there's so much we've gotten into today. Um, thank you so much for sharing your insight, your perspective. Where can people learn more about you and your work? Actually, they can get a nine-step roadmap to complete financial choice. I don't talk about retirement or any of that at wealthonanyincome.com forward slash TEDx. And they'll hear my TEDx talk and they can get this roadmap. It's a 27 page roadmap that explains each of the nine steps one by one. That's awesome. Thank you. And for those of you all listening, we'll put those in the show notes or if you're watching, you can see they're in the links below. Thank you so much, Renny. I've really enjoyed hearing your perspective on a lot of things and especially us looking at some of the things that maybe perhaps people have oversimplified things on or, or overcomplicated things. So thank you so much for your perspective. Thank you so much for the work you're doing um, with the charity and the support that you're doing. I really appreciate you coming out. Uh, thank you, Wade. Again, thank you for the opportunity to talk about Shelter to Soldier and support other people. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And for those of you all listening, uh, thank you for listening. And as always, I look forward to helping you help more people and make more money in less time doing what you do best so you can better enjoy your family, your friends, and your life. Thank you.